Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. I have with me Justin Sliwa. How are you, Justin? Sir, I'm doing good. How are you today? Thank you, sir. So Justin is a raw, raw land investing expert. He knows exactly where new investors struggle. He has reached massive success in his own business. And to it, today he's on a mission to help others learn to harness the enormous potential offered by land investments. Incredible ROI, massive cash profits, and sustained passive income. So I have also dabbled into land investing. I didn't do it, but I tried to learn as much as I could from some of the other land investing experts. Uh -huh. So I'm looking forward to this episode myself to learn more. <laughs> no, I'm glad. It's, uh, lands, it lands a funny niche. There's, there's a few of us that are in the coaching space here, um, and we all do it a little bit differently. I'll have our, our stuff that we really like to focus on. We really hammer home. I appreciate you having me on today. Absolutely. So Justin, tell us something interesting about yourself, something which we cannot guess. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I race BMX bikes with my kids. Oh, um, really? Yeah. So we race little pedal bikes and uh, we uh, actually are going for the state championship. I'm in contention for the number one state in Texas. No way. And, and my, my kids are in the top 10 right now. We, so we go this weekend and we'll find out whether we, we make the cut or not. Wow. So how old are they? I have seven-year-old twins and a two-and-a-half-year-old. So I'm a, I'm a busy wow. guy. And uh, we got my son into it. He learned how to ride a bike about a year and a half. Uh, well, July would be a year. And so we signed him up for a, a little race league. And then uh, so I saw my Facebook time, time travel that he had just stood up for the first time on his bike on a track a year ago. And now he's competing for the number one spot in the state. So – it's uh, it's been a fun year for that's us. That's amazing, man. That's that's DNA. Yeah, well, I'd say that's it's uh, we. You say something. I don't look like a guy that goes and rides a little bitty right, bicycle exactly. that you rode around as a kid. So <laughs> it's uh, it's fun for us. So we we do it as a family, and it allows us to get out, be active, and it's yes. really boosted my son's confidence because he's a smaller kid. He's a twin with a sister, right. and he's smaller, so it's right. boosted his confidence. He's got a little bit more energy, stamina, and a little more swagger to him. Oh, that, that's awesome. And I love uh, doing activities with family, right? Yeah. That's what is, it's all about. Why do we work so hard, right? Yeah. And, and staying active. So yeah, that's great. When and how did you start investing in real estate? Man, so my real estate journey is a little bit different than a lot of people. I, um, I, had, I had a corporate job. I was in corporate America for you know, 15 years. With them, they always liked to move you. When you were doing good there, they would move you. And so right. I got moved eight times in seven years, but it was like a corporate sponsored flip. Like they always guaranteed right. to sell your house. So you try to go in and buy low and then sell. And I knew I was selling every year, year and a half, and I do the right upgrades. But I moved back to Fort Worth, um, shoot, probably about seven years ago, six years ago. And my best friend here, we had an Amazon company and it was number, we had a couple number one products and, you know, everybody likes these side hustles. And so that's what we're doing. Yes. And he comes to me, he goes, Hey, I want to get back into real estate investing. And he was top 25 under 25 as a realtor. And I said, great, let's do it. He said, I want to liquidate the Amazon company and start real estate investing. He said, that's, I'd learned about land investing and I want to do it. We can buy land for a hundred dollars an acre. And I'm like, man, okay. He said, but I'm gonna do it by myself. So I'm like, well, what am I going to do? And he said, you should do it too. We'll just do it separately. So I was like, okay, well, my wife's not working. Let's make this a side hustle for her. And I'll just kind of front it. And we, I made good money. I had a good job. Right. And so we did our first marketing campaign. And this was in 2000, late 2016. And we sent out, I'll call 2,500 blind offers. And we bought 21 properties. Nice. And as the calls were coming back in, my wife's like, I don't want to do this. This is not what I want to do. <laughs> and so I ended up with a real estate investing company at that point that I had already funded. I was like, well, I've already spent the money. We're making money. It's something right. that's going to happen. Then uh, three months later, I get that Friday morning phone call that says, hey, what? You don't have a job anymore. Right. And of course. <laughs> I've got this brand new company, three, three, three four months going on. Um, I've made $70,000 so far in that first three months off those 21 properties. And I'm like, what do I do? Do I go, go back to corporate America and just keep doing Because I was a right. chief operating officer for a railroad. Oh, wow. So, okay. So I had a pretty good job, pretty good payroll. Right. I was pretty right. secure. And 
and always done well with our money. So I was like, I could, I could risk it for the next six months and not feel a, not feel a bleep there and just really try to roll this and see if we could get it going. And we've turned it company since. And so now here we are, um, we've got a private funding company. We were the first in the land investing niche to do that. We have a podcast and consulting company. And then we are, so we call it our media company. And then we have our land investing company as well. That's great. So, and um, now that I understand, but why did you choose real estate? Was that a choice or it was just, it just happened? <laughs> it was kind of, it was that, it was that opportunity. I've always had a side business going. And that opportunity, when, when he came to me and said, hey, you can buy land, he started buying five-acre properties for 500 bucks. And when I saw that, I was like, I will buy every five-acre property you can give me for $500. And that's just unheard of in a lot of markets. But there are markets out there that you can do that. So after buying a few of those and making you know, pretty good returns, buying them for 500, selling for 2,000, you know, you're like, those are good percentage returns. But is that something that you can make a living and live? You know, if you're accustomed to a six-figure income, can you make a living off that? And what's the volume look like? Or how do you scale from there? And so when you ask if real estate was kind of an option, I had an Amazon company. I've owned a supplement company. I've owned several different types of companies where you bought a product and you sold it for more. And right. real estate was just now I've got that asset there. I'm just buying for less and selling for more. So it just fit really well. Oh, that, that's interesting. That makes sense. So you're, you're like me, you dabble into everything. <laughs> and then yeah, you figure I, I, out. I've slowed, <laughs> I've slowed down a lot on that because it's got me in, it, I don't say it's got me in trouble. It's got me overextended in my, right, my decision making. So I, that, uh, that is the problem with entrepreneurs, right? Because yeah. once you dabble into so much and then it, it gets hard to, you know, manage everything, right? Yeah. But yeah. No, that's great. So uh, let's talk about the book. And I have, I'm yet to read your book, but okay. the book, book title is Coffee Money Investing. What do you mean by that? Okay. The book's called Coffee Money Real Estate Investing. Um, and, I, and I'll let you know, you're, you can get it on Amazon or any of the distributors out there. But if you just go to that website, coffeemoneyrei.com, I've got a special there. It's $9.99 for your listeners. So I, just, I don't want to plug it, but I want your guys to save money if, they, if they're interested in the book. And sure. what we did is we find that a lot of real estate in you can under your own money. And for a lot of people, you have to be really good to do that. And you have to have a little bit of luck falling on your side. I took the idea said, Hey, if I can buy real estate for the, what I spend on my coffee, if I go to Starbucks every day and you can become a real estate investor for that, what does that look like? And can we lay out a plan for that? And that 21 page book, it, it does that. It shows you that you can buy um, over the counter tax deed properties from the state of Arkansas all online make an offer between fifteen and a hundred dollars and then turn around and sell them on Craigslist, Zillow, eBay, any of the marketing material, any of the places out there, marketplaces out there, and you're selling them for about an average of five hundred dollars. So if you're a if you're looking for a side hustle, it gives you a really detailed look at how to buy property for fifty bucks and sell them for five hundred dollars. And if you're doing that once a month, you're making your car payment, you're making your utility bills payment. And it's not a Am I getting rich? We're just making our life a little bit easier, plus understanding the process of real estate investing. Oh, that, that is very interesting. So, so you just mentioned that, but I just want to, you know, reiterate, can you really buy land using coffee money? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can. So let's think, let's, what's, what's Starbucks cost? Five bucks? Right, yeah. So five bucks times 30 is $150. Right, for a month. That means yeah. you can buy three properties for 50 bucks each. Those three wow. properties are going to bring you back $1,500. Anywhere from, and what we do on eBay is, and, I, and I'll walk you through this, you can check ads, you'll see other people have done this because we've sold a lot of copies of the book, but they will buy property for 50 bucks, they put it on, on eBay at no reserve, and then have a $395 dock fee. So when somebody checks out, they, oh. they, they win it for $100, they pay the 395 dock fee, so now you paid 50 bucks for the property, $70 listed on eBay, you're going to spend 25 to record the deed in the new person's name. Right. And so now you have, you know, $150 in it at 395 doc fee. You keep the difference between the 150 and the 395 plus whatever the bid was. And that's all profit. Ah, that is very interesting. So, uh, and, and we'll, we'll dig deep now in land investing, but okay. uh, do, is there any just recording fee or is there title insurance and all of those things as well? So these properties are bought with a, um, a limited warranty deed from the state. 
Okay. And then you're selling on a quick claim deed. So you bought it, it's in your name, and then you're selling the rights away. So you're not getting title insurance or doing that on these type of properties. Okay. Now, this is just to get you going. This is like, this is, right. isn't, you're not going to make a career out of that. It's right, a, right. It's this a is a start. To, like yeah, wholesaling. You know, people <laughs> tell you, hey, I, I, you can get started in real estate with no money out of pocket. This is a way to get started realistically for 50 bucks to buy. Right. A yeah. I, I don't believe so. those claims, right? Which you just mentioned, no money out of pocket, this, that. Because that, that, those How many things do not exist. Have been this, says, hey, I can get you, yeah, I, I can make you millions in real estate with no money out of your pocket, but pay me $5,000 to do it. Exactly. I'm saying this is a, <laughs> I'm saying this is a, a, a $9.99 ebook that's going to show you how to buy a property for 50 bucks. And this is just, it's a way to get what we do in our business out there to people and say, hey, you know, this is a way to get you started. It's no nonsense, no fluff. If you like what you read, come listen to the podcast, come come see us. We have a course that teaches you how we run our land business as well. We call it the land flipping blueprint. And we can talk about it there. We want you to have some trust and understand that, Hey, we're the no frills kind of guys. We're not going to sell you all this fluff and then under deliver. We're going to, we're going to say, Hey, this is what we're going to teach you. And then you're like, wow, I got this much value out of it. So I'd rather um, undersell and over deliver than the, the opposite. So you, you, you mentioned state of Arkansas. Are there other states as well where you can buy, um, you know, properties um, with coffee money? It, 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 it will have in what it's called or an over the counter list. These are properties that went through the sales process, but didn't sell and they will take a, a bid. The reason we like Arkansas is because it's very centralized. You can go to the, you can go to the website and it has every County, and every property there versus most states uh, have it at the county level. And you have to find the department. Right. To find that yes. So yes. this is just a, and that's why we use Arkansas because it's really centralized. You just mail in a check with the, the property it has a form. It's a one page form. You just fill out and you make your offer, you staple it to it. You can throw three or four of them in the envelope. And then in a, about a week or two, they'll send you back whether you got the property accepted or not. And then you run through the, the wait periods that they require. Got it. So basically you send the money and if the, if you did not win it, they send you the check back. Is that okay? Yeah. And if, if you got the, if you got the property, is there any other process you got to wait for a certain time? Tax, no, they, no, taxes? So the, yeah. So the, the taxes are covered by your bid. So if you offer 50 bucks and add $300 in taxes, they clear all that off. Oh, now, there, may be some, there may be some liens or some special assessments against it. You'll find out uh, you can find out by checking with the county. Say, hey, is there a special assessment in this county for like fire department or water drains? And right. you'll be responsible for that. Um, but typically, I figure there's going to be about $100 per property and back something that's not that's kind of missed or just going to pop up. Um, but, you know, it's still a good way to get started. Now, the, the fun part of that is that gets you going. And then what we talk about now is our buying a property that has a value of about what a bass boat is or a Harley Davidson or an RV camper. Okay. It's that piece of property that the husband can tell their wife they're investing and they have this nice piece of property. He can go drive his camper to camp, go hunt, go fish, build his cabin and get away. And he can be proud of it uh, when he gets back to the, the office. And the cool thing about those type properties are we can source them in almost every state but you can get them to a realtor to sell to where you're really hands off. All you do is source the properties, find them, bring them to market, but with a realtor that specializes in land in that area and they sell them for you. Oh, okay. Interesting. So in, in that case, do you buy the property first from the seller and then sell it? Or do you do like wholesaling? Uh, no, I, I always take them in. Now there's a few instances where I may do an option agreement, but I try to bring everything in and buy it. So I know I have clean title. Right. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, advertising a property that I'm the seller of, but I'm really not yeah. the owner yet. I, I, I try to stay away from that. Now that's a good way to do it. If you don't have a lot of cash or you don't have the ability to fund deals. Um, but it's not something I, I do because I've watched too many times where an investor is doing that. And then a guy that's got cash comes in and offers it straight to the owner right. and the owner kind of backs out of that option agreement or that thing. Yeah. And there's ways to, to protect yourself. But at the end of the day, if you're not performing on your contract, you send them a purchase and sales agreement to buy the property, then you put a six month close date so you can right. advertise. <laughs> that guy's wanting to move the property. So if he gets yeah, cash offer, he's going to take it. Yeah. If he's agreeing to the price and terms, then, you know, of course he needs money or he wants to yep. move that property. Right. Yeah. So now that's interesting. So right now, what's your focus? What kind of properties do you look for? And in, are, are they in particular states or so markets? I uh, not in particular states. I've bought and sold properties in 40, I think we did 40, the 43rd state here this last month. Um, 
I look for a market value type with a certain type of property. So I look for a recreational property that has a market value of somewhere under $2,000 an acre. And I typically try to buy those for about 30 cents on a dollar. Um, wow. I send out a ton of blind offers. It's not a bunch of mail. And I do that from there's up to the 250 acres. And I really find a sweet spot in that 20 to 40 acres because if I'm buying a 20 acre for just simple math, if I'm going to, if it's worth a thousand dollars an acre, it's going to sell for 20 grand. I'm typically offering about six to $7,000 on that. Now these aren't huge numbers by like apartment syndications, you know, right. I'm not Grant Cardone driving in my private jet with my Bentleys no. and everything. That's not his about, money. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. So if you think about this though, if, if, I told you, hey, you give you put six thousand dollars into this property, and you sent you spend two thousand dollars in marketing material. You turn around, and you so you've got eight grand in this first property, and you sell it for twenty, and that's a realistic number that most people can come up with. But right. you offer owner financing and say, hey, I'm not a bank, but twenty five percent down at ten percent interest up to ten years. You have people that can come up with five or six thousand dollars. Now you've got all your money exactly. on the first property. You've created passive income, and you have a recurring income. Yep. Yeah, and I and I don't want to call it passive because you worked for it, but right. you've set up, you've set up recurring income over the next 10 yeah, years yeah. at 10% interest on equity that you just, you created yourself. Right. So no, that, you, that's really become, awesome. you really create that. So uh, is that what you focus on now more of owner financing? Yeah. And that's what I did with, uh, saw with Mark Podolsky as well. Yeah. So Mark's program, Mark, Mark teaches that and he, he builds this big machine with VAs and stuff like that. I offer owner financing as an exit strategy for me out of the property, but I tr most of my properties sell for cash. Okay. So my last five properties that closed were 100 acres, another 100 acres, 40 acres, um, and you know, 20. I closed a, a two-acre place in South Carolina this week. I just closed it yesterday. So you know, they kind of range in that, but they could be anything from me buying for the, on the high end, the biggest one was bought for 63,000 and we sold for 170,000 of uh, the smallest one, the smallest deal. And it, this isn't a win by us or by our standards, but when you look at it in investing, we bought it for $10,000 with closing cost. It sold for 14, five. That's not a win in my book. But when you look at percentages, you're like, ah, oh, I made 40% return on my money in less than three months. That's not a bad day. It's just, it's not what you're used to. Right. No, that makes sense. So, um, which, are there any particular states which you prefer over others when you are um, doing this? Uh, so I say, are they easier say, to deal with? Or yeah, there's a few states that I stay out of, and I'll leave it at that. Um, I stay out of West Virginia because of the foreign LLC entity stuff. They want oh. you, the way they want you recording and how you have to do it. It's it's not very. I don't want to call it very friendly for somebody outside of the state. Uh, California, I typically stay out of. Of course, California. <laughs> it's, uh, and it's not, there, there's tons of great deals there. I just, I, I don't like some of the ways the, that they tax us. Republic of California. Yeah. <laughs> so I stay out of there. Um, some really good states that have done really well for us. Um, which New York, I'm not a huge, they take 10% from you or 8.86% in estimated taxes from you when you go to close. Um, but in its slow process, but it's been a pretty good uh, state for us to work in. Florida is a good state. Um, so it, there's, there are some good states, but again, it's for me, it's the recreational type property and that thousand to $2,000 per acre market value. And then trying to get it for a lot less. Got it. And are there any gotchas to keep in mind while you invest in uh, land? Oh man, there's lots of gotchas. You're going <laughs> to... As emotional driven as houses are per se. Um, but in, in land, you tip in recreational land, you typically, ha you really want to understand the laws of heirs uh, when you have um, people that passed away generational land. So grandma died, left it to her three kids, three kids died, left it to their kids. Understanding how that works in probates in those state and ways oh. to get around probate. Those that's like, I have to solve because if I understand that in a state, it's a, it'll, it opens up so many more deals that the normal person doesn't know. So either get a really good attorney in that state that understands it and you know, you're really friendly with them and you keep good retainer with them and you keep them moving right. um, or you learn the laws there and how, and that way when a deal comes across your desk, you understand how to break it down real quick because I'll say that probably half the deals that I have, my, my best, my best 10 deals have all had some kind of deed work that I had to fix that 
luckily I understood then the, the next guy may not have understood it as well as I did. Now people are getting better because we talk about it on our podcast, but you know, at first I, I heard somebody tell me uh, early on uh, three, four years ago is a land investing guru. He said, if somebody could figure out de- deaths on deeds, they would become a millionaire instantly. And so I took that to, to heart. And so in the States that I work really heavily in, I understand their probate laws extremely well. And that's because if somebody's dead on the deed, I know how to get around it. And that creates extremely a, a lot of value for me. So my, I had four deals in the first quarter this year that we bought for 150,000. They sold for 400,000 all collectively. And three of the four deals all had deaths on deeds that I had to fix. Oh, wow. Okay. That's interesting. So yeah, uh, I just bought a couple of lots here uh, in Central Valley of California and uh, my builder friend, because he has been building new houses there for a while. So we are going to build new house and sell them. So we are, we are actually going through the plants and also I I didn't do land investing before, Mm -hmm. but this would be my first land uh, bought. But our goal is to, you know, because California is struggling with, uh, you know, affordable housing and Central Valley is still affordable. So we'll be raising some uh, private money to uh, build the houses. So okay. th- that, that's my goal. Yeah. But do you do semi- anything like that? I know we chatted right before the podcast yeah. that you buy the land and try to develop so as well. T- I, I, if you would have asked me this six months ago, I told you, no, I won't, I won't do anything right. like that. Now, had the opportunity come up that I wanted to, I've been wanting to build a certain type of commercial warehouse uh, flex space suite. And I had kind of visited in my mind, kind of like the, you see the man cave that these guys with exotic cars have, and they have these man caves with the couches yes. and stuff. And I thought, man, that would be a really cool office for like an entrepreneur. Um, right. <laughs> but then what the other flex side of that is I could put it where the service people, like a guy that owns a plumbing company or something small and afford, essentially you talked about affordable housing, affordable office space that allowed more than what, like you would see it like a shared space, but a, um, a little bit, you know, not somebody's going to have to, a new business not have to go into a three or $4,000 a month rent or $10,000 a month rent. You know, I target about fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars $1,600 a month oh, okay. and it rent for them. And so when I put it down on paper with the pro forma, with what our building costs were going to cost in the land that we got in the location, it just, it made, made great sense that it's at, with an eight cap, it, it added like 600,000 in equity the moment we had it all leased out, you know, and so and at least and rent it out. And that's if every, you know, it, it, there's some things there. So after looking at it, um, I have a friend that's a developer. He says, well, yes, we'll do this one with you, but we're going to, the only way is we're doing five more with you afterwards. So, oh wow, <laughs> yeah. So it, it kind of turned into a bigger project. Um, so that's one of my projects going on for 2021. We're also subdividing and building some cabins, uh, off grid cabins and areas. So like we talked about recreational land. Right. A lot of people have the dream to go to this off grid cabin So they buy that land thinking they're going to do that, but they never realize the dream. They never do it. So we're taking it a step farther and and trying to have that in place for them. So by doing that, we force appreciation by subdividing. Then we add the structure in, which we have teams in place where we're doing that at. And, you know, we go from what typically we'd make, you know, a hundred percent on our money, 200%. It's, it's like 300, 400% now. And it's just a, super neat little way to do this. And it's not to a point that the, the little guy, as you will, versus a big corporate developer couldn't get into right. this. Anymore. Yes. No, that's awesome. That's so let's talk about deals. Uh, what is your best deal so far? Man. Uh, so I got two that stick out. I'm going to say this one was from 2017. You know, I'm still turning from losing my job, trying to make this work. And I had this guy from California. He reached out, he goes, Hey, you sent us the letter. I, I, thought I got a hold of you. Here's the con- the purchase and sales agreement you sent me. It was 135 acres in uh, a county in Oklahoma. And I offered him $45,000 for it. He said, I'll take the money. He goes, but my grandpa bought this, gave it to my dad. My dad bought it and gave it to three boys. And then one of the boys has died again. There's multiple dead in the transfer. So that was my first taste into that piece of it. And so I found an, uh, an attorney. We walked through it, got it all cleaned up. And I bought it. I was all in at like $52,000. I sold it to the neighbor for $145,000. Wow. Which, so it was right under my six figure, like a six figure profit. But that was two and a half months into the business, three months into the business full time. I think I might have been three months full time in the business. So, you know, I had really good deal. My first mailer had two mailers that kind of busted a little bit. 
then it hit this one and that kind of set up my next year for the company so I could really focus on it. Um, and then another one is I had a guy, a, a, an investor, he said, hey, I'll back you if you want to buy an apartment complex. I want you to do what you do on land, but I want you to do it for apartment complexes. So I oh. ended up getting a 10 unit apartment complex off a of blind offer. Like I sent letters of intent to about 2000 apartment owners. Right. And I had a guy call me back. He wanted out of the apartment game. And it was, <laughs> it was a 10 unit place. And I offered him like $315,000 for it. And he's like, or I offered him 300. He goes, nah, give me 315. You can have it. I got to negotiate a little bit with you. Nice. I said, okay, you know, that works fully leased out. It, they had a property nice. manager who was also the maintenance man. So yeah. I get there and I, I, he magically got let go that day that I showed up. Of course. Renegoti <laughs> renegotiated the contracts on some other stuff like the mowing, the trash, uh, talk to the tenants. And they were like, you know, we've, we've had this security line for six months. It just doesn't work. And I was like, okay, call the light company, had the, the security light fixed, then went into their apartments and put a new carpet on the stairs because it had hardwoods everywhere else, but carpet on the stairs. They had, they were the original carpets on the stairs. So now so you open the door and it went upstairs oh. to the bedrooms and the things down there. So you imagine the smell. Now they got this new carpet. I put three appliance packages in. So I think after rehab, I was in three in closing cost. I might've been in 325, maybe 330. And I was at the gym a month later talking to another buddy of mine. He, he'd invest. And I said, yeah, I got this apartment complex and I sold it to him. Like I think after a closing cost, it was eight weeks total for $475,000. Nice. So that money, we took the profit from it and started our private funding company. And now we've helped about 300 clients fund their raw land deals and where we partner with them as a JV. That's awesome. What was your worst deal so far? Oh man. Um, everybody's got a couple of those deals early on right. where they want to fight the access and land investing. It's about access. If you can't access your land, you don't have a deal. And I am so strict on it now because I had bought some stuff out in the desert that had a road going to it. You couldn't see barbed wire fences and you get a guy out there that's bought your property from you and he's driving out there and runs into it. So, um, Oh my God. Bought the worst deal bought for $8,000, turned around and sold it with the, with the not letting them know, Hey, this fence is there. Sold it for $7,000. So I lost a thousand bucks. It was an expensive, it was an expensive lesson. Could have went really, it could have went a lot worse, but right. you know, that, yeah, that's it's the not worst bad. of it. I, I, I think it's important to have those because those keep you humble, but they also hone in how right. you run your business. You have to have stuff like that happen or you don't get better. Exactly. No, that's a great point. Let's take a quick break. Okay. Welcome back to Wealth Matters Podcast. Justin, are you ready with five round? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Would you be changing any business or investment strategy after coronavirus? So coronavirus played for us. It, it slowed down the paperwork side of the business. The sell side kind of slowed down at first because people didn't know what was going to happen. So they, right. I'm sorry, that our acquisition, the seller selling to us, our acquisition side, because they didn't know what was going to happen. They kind of held everything tight to the chest. Um, once we got deals, we were having problems getting them through the county, through closing and things like that. And then we would get them on the market and they would sell super fast. So we're flying through inventory through Corona, which is odd oh, compared to a lot okay. of people but it's just the paperwork piece getting it through. So what we're doing for changing, a, we're going to change our business model a little bit coming out of Corona where we're going to slow down the deal where we'll go in and buy a bigger piece and create inventory inside that, that with the subdivide. So if I buy a hundred acres, uh, I may split okay. it into five twenties. Well, I know the deed works good. I know all that paperwork's good on the front side. Now I have five pieces of inventory that I can kind of slowly move out, right. which slows down the velocity in some cases, but it allows us to, Buy one, make five, and then continue right. to grow that. And, yeah, yeah. and you may be able to get your money out from one or two parcels. Exactly, <laughs> exactly right. Oh, that's great. Um, favorite real estate, finance, or any other related book? Oh, I, so I'm, I'm going to tell on myself here. I've been doing a lot of time. For the first couple of years that we were, I was on my business on my own, and I spent a lot of time trying to hone different pieces of the craft. Like I'm going to learn, like I talked about deaths on deeds and learning about that and different laws and probate. Now, I'm doing a little bit more soul searching. I've been with my wife for 19 years. Um, so a lot of the entrepreneurs out there will relate to this. When business is good, life is really good around the house. Right. When business gets tough, it gets a little tough. And you start finding your, your breaking points in your relationship because that's your person. So you take yes. it. So uh, I just finished a book and, I, and I'm going to throw this out there. It's, it's called Love and Respect. Um, and it's, 
it talks about how men see things and women see things. It's kind of like a more of a um, doctor approach to men are from uh, Mars, Mars. Are from <laughs> Venus, or, you know, that book. So, and I, and I know that's not business, but I think a lot of us, our business and our personal lives, they inter, interweave oh, so yes. much that we can get ourselves into a situation where something's not good at home, we take it out on our business. If something's not good in our business, we carry it back into our house when we walk out of the office. And so I'm learning a little bit more about myself. So I'm going to say that's, a, that's been a great book. So if anybody takes that advice, read it. Let your wife read it as well because we, it, it basically says men look through like a lens of blue and a here in blue and women, you know, in pink and that. And it talks about men really thrive on respect and women really thrive on love. And that's kind of a, we don't talk about what the men need as much because uh, we, we typically are stonewalled. We don't want to open up. We yes. kind of hold back. So I, I would take that challenge and it, it was a book recommended by, to me. And so I'm going to pass that recommendation. Oh, that's, that's, that's a great on. recommendation. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to buy one. <laughs> yeah. It's a, and it's an older book. I think they sold a couple million print already. So oh, wow. I mean, it's, it's not something new, but it is a, it's a new twist that a lot of us don't think about. And so like, if, uh, if we think about, and I'll just say this, so we don't stay on it too long because I don't want to keep us going, but um, you know, if the, as a man, is, if you and you're fighting with your spouse and you say, Hey, if a man said that to me in my house, I would hurt them. But my wife, when she talks to me like that, I can't because it's my wife. And right. I don't have it, so we shut down. So that is a way that we communicate different amongst men and the women. And so when we should have a conversation and be able to notice those things that put us on this weird, crazy cycle, I'm not respected. So I'm not loving her. She doesn't love me. I'm not going to respect right. her. So it's just this crazy cycle. I went a long time on that book, but I, I think it's important that you have those conversations. Yeah. All this gold, man. Yeah. <laughs> Any tool or website you recommend for in your business or you, you can't live without? Well, for us, it's, it's a couple different types of websites and tools. Um, we use a data tree. It's a first American company to pull our third party, um, our data. And with that, what about data? I mean, owner records. So I can pull okay. up if, if it's an accounting and I want to know apartment complex owners. I want to know single family resident owners. I want to know everybody. And then I can get that for, you know, a nickel a piece and I can pull out a list and say, Hey, I want, like, I just did this last night, houses in a certain zip code. I want, um, 900 square feet to 2000 square feet under 2000 uh, feet uh, uh, under $200,000 uh, value because they're going to be rentals and pull that list up. And I get 29,000 homeowners right then. Now, if I want to say absentee owners, I could make those adjustments right. out of state, out of County and make those adjustments. And within seconds, I have that. And we also partnered with a company called priced um, priced is a uh, we took them on early on, fixed some logic. So they uh, can pull the data and price for an offer for a blind mailer campaign automatically. Oh, nice. And so we, we just started the beta version for houses. We've been doing it with land for a couple months. And then the first mailer I did with them on land, I think I spent, I don't know, $1,200 in mail and data cost. And it yielded back 70000 in profit. Very so, nice. Yeah. So that's, so that's go ahead. What was the first website? I think your voice was breaking. So, Oh, uh, datatree.com. Datatree.com. Okay. Thank yeah. you. And we'll put that in the show notes and yep. even, you know, I'll check out the price.com as well. Yeah, price is it's P R Y C D.com. Okay. If you use forward slash casual Fridays, um, it'll give you a discount on this stuff. Okay. Got it. Any advice for beginner investors? My, my biggest advice is, you're going to hit times that are tough and it, you have to continue to move and keep going. Um, you made a joke about the shiny object syndrome earlier. There's going to be a piece of that, but if you start with your real estate, learn your piece or your niche and then slowly branch off of that, it's not shiny object. Then now you're layering your company. So, and I, and I say that because we started with coffee money type properties, moved into the bass boat. Then we started funding deals because we already knew how to look if a deal was good or not. We put our money where our mouth is on those deals and so we were able to expand our business and our scalability because we have 400, 500 people out looking for deals for us at all times that we can JV. And then we look for our own deals as well. So we have multiple facets of our business, not because we were like a, a squirrel just bouncing around. We were, we were laying our companies for it for a certain reason. So as you do that, don't stop. And then make sure you don't get too far off of what your core competencies are and layer your company. That's awesome. How do you give back? So for me, it's, this is kind of, it's funny. We talked about the book earlier. Um, my grandmother, she, uh, she started a foundation in the early eighties and it's a, uh, it's a, a ranch where some, um, mentally challenged adults live full time. And 
they sold the ranch in like 83 and the foundation and, and somebody else took it over the, uh, it's a Catholic church organization, but they took it over. Um, and so when I wrote the book and I put it up, I, I give half the profits back to them. And I know that we're talking like, this is a monetary give back. And along with a lot of the other stuff that we do with our podcast and free consulting and some things like that, like I'll, I'll pick somebody out of that, that our audience there and help them for free. But this to me is, it's kind of one of those things that they don't know who I am. They don't know. Cause it's the That's lady nice. I call her my grandmother. She, uh, she, she raised me as her grandson, but I'm no, no relation. And oh, so, wow. so the, so this family, they get a monthly, every time I get paid from the distributor, I send them half the money and they just know every month they get this money from this guy. They have no idea who I am. And, and I like it like that. And so I don't get a Christmas card from them or anything. They, they, they'll send me thanks. You know, if they have like a big thing, I'll send another drive. If we have a really, uh, an, they have like a, a drive in there, I'll send another profit or another piece of, um, you know, donation. But to me, it's, there's some people that have been putting some challenges that, that they didn't have. And so if I can make their life a little bit easier and what really drove it is I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw the foundation pop up and I was like, Oh wow. And they were asking for like Mac and cheese or like a blanket because the oh, heaters were going yeah. bad. And it was just like little things like that. And I was like, it's kind of our duty to help those. that can right. help themselves. Yes. So that's, that's one of the, one of the many things I do. And I, and I also do a lot of volunteering with the kids. We do what's called all-star dads at school because a lot of broken homes, the kids don't get to see a male figure. So we go outside as they're getting out of the cars, we give them high fives and nice. you know, hype them up as they're going into it. So, uh, it becoming a father really changed a lot of the outlook yes. I had on life. <laughs> and, and so if I get the opportunity to do anything with the kids, I, I try to be part of that because there's that old adage, be who you needed as a, as a kid. Right. And I try to live by that mantra. Yeah, no, I, I can attest to that. You know, being a dad changed me from yeah. my fitness perspective that I got to keep up with my kids. Uh -huh. Being, you know, I, I became a dad leader at the Boy Scouts. You know, yeah. there were a lot of changes which I wouldn't have done. So that's awesome. How can yeah. my listeners reach out to you? They can find us um, you, on our podcast. It's Casual Fridays, REI.com. Uh, it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They're not very long. They're 15 to 20 minutes long. Uh, any of the social media networks under my name or you can go to Casual Fridays. Uh, or, you know, Justin at Casual Fry. Thank you so much, Justin. And I enjoyed the podcast. Cool. I'm glad. Thanks for listening to the Wealth Matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing.